All right, so our last session, um, and I know this is something on everyone's minds, is um, how are we going to pay for this? So I'd like to welcome up Darren Rose from POM Consulting, which stands for Peace of Mind. Um, and then Joe Wasik from Huntington is going to give some clo closing remarks. Yes, and then the scholarships at the end, so hang tight. Okay, good evening, thank you. I'm Darren Rose from POM College Consulting. I get the best for last to talk about the money. So first of all, um, I, I w I'll try not to bore you with a bunch of terminology and acronyms and everything, but I, there's a few that I wanna make sure that everybody gets tonight. Uh, but, the, but first and foremost, I wanna share a lot of myths, a lot of things that I run into with families when I consult with them, and I'm sure everybody all over here's a lot of things um, sometimes it's just good to know that something is not true or that when everybody is talking about it you know five moms are out to lunch and four of them already had a kid go through school and the fifth mom is like oh my gosh I don't even know what they're talking about and they know everything they know the best places to eat and the best clothes to wear so they must know everything about college by and large that's not always true so the first thing I hear a lot from families that I really want to address because I think it's so important is, is it really worth going to college? Like, is, it's gotten crazy expensive, and is it really worth it? And the honest truth is, it isn't for everybody, but I will always defend the college investment. Most families will borrow some money for college, and that's kind of what makes it so overwhelming. You know, if you've saved appropriately and you have all the money or you inherited money, and you can just drop a check on the financial, on the bursar's office desk, it's not so stressful. But if you're borrowing and you don't know which loans to take and you don't know, you know, $100,000 education is actually gonna be 170 when we're done with all the interest. But what I would say is most families, I don't know, maybe not most, but a high majority of families that send a student to college also are homeowners. And if you ever look at your mortgage paperwork, you wind up paying back three times as much as you borrowed usually to begin with. At the end of 30 years or 15 years or 20 years, you've got a free and clear asset. You've had tax advantages. There's been all these great reasons to have borrowed money to own your home. The cool thing with college is you can borrow all that money and long before the loans are paid off, it's already a valuable asset. You're already out in the real world and all the studies about recessions and employment and you know salary ranges for college grads versus non, they're completely in favor of the college education. So. That's my uh, public service thought on why you should go to college. Things you should think about when you are getting ready to go for college, to, to college, as early as possible, and myths that come with it. First thing is, how much are you willing to spend as a family? That is crucial. I, I heard it talked about earlier tonight. It's, it's just incredibly important to not wait until we've got all the acceptance letters and then we have to say, no, we cannot afford that, or taking a school off a list because you thought the sticker price was too high, not understanding the whole financial aid process. So it's really helpful to figure out as a group, mom and dad, student, whoever's gonna be involved in this, how much are we willing to spend? How much are we willing to borrow? Who's gonna be responsible for those loans? It may be a little bit of an uncomfortable conversation the first time through, but it's a lot less uncomfortable than we didn't realize school was gonna cost 170,000 and we're borrowing 120 of it and you can't go. You're, it's just not gonna happen. That's, that's a horrible feeling. So it's, it's also extremely valuable to have the kid involved, the student involved in this. In no, you know, kids don't understand loans necessarily. No offense to the students who are here, but just because you borrowed a dollar from a friend in the cafeteria line because you were short that day, you paid it back the next day. I've borrowed money, I know what it's like to pay back money. Mm, it's a little different than you owe $73,000, your interest payment is higher than our mortgage payment, and it's, gonna last a long time. So it's really important to understand that, you know, as a family, as a group. It's very important to not listen to your sister-in-law whose kid got a full ride, your neighbor's friend got a scholarship, everybody you know has always gotten a scholarship. Because I'll say to families, what's your plan to pay for school? Scholarships. Based on, I mean, you don't know our son, but he has never gotten less than a C. He's a darn good student. He's getting a scholarship. He might, but it might be for you know, a very small amount. It might be for a large amount. But in your little packet that's going around, I just wanted to give you a couple of takeaways. 
one of the first things uh, to kind of keep in mind is full ride scholarships, 0.3% of all students going to college as a freshman are getting a full ride. And a large percentage of them might be playing football or basketball, a big revenue producer for the school. So there's close to 40,000 high schools in the country multiplied by X number of kids in every class. It's a lot of kids going to school and not 3%, 0.3% of them are getting the proverbial full ride. So do not, whether you're talking to me or anybody or even yourselves, you're not paying for college by scholarships in most cases. So that, that, again, you always know somebody who got one, but they didn't tell you the scholarship was only for tuition or it was like, hey, he got a soccer scholarship. He did, but there was one soccer scholarship for the whole soccer team and it got divided between 12 kids. He really did get a scholarship, but it didn't pay for everything. So it doesn't necessarily mean you're a failure if your student didn't get one or if you're the student, oh, I should have tried harder. Everybody I know got a scholarship. Very important. Types of aid, types of scholarship. There's need-based money, which is going to be based on your financial need. And then there's merit-based money, which are going to be based on your merits. A very important lesson I learned when I started being in the college consulting world early on with merit. It's very important to understand where you need to be at various schools to get merit-based money. And in most cases, you can at least get a pretty good idea of that. One of the first families I ever worked with, their son got a 27 on the ACT. And the school he wanted to get into required a 27 for the program he was going for. He got his 27. His parents both went to that school. He had been raised on you know, the school's colors and everything was about that school. So everybody was delighted. Well, when he got to school, he met his roommate. He found out that guy's in the same program as he is. They have the same interest in sports. They like the same kind of girls. They like the same kind of everything. Great relationship. Six months into school, they're in spring, and they're talking about money one, late one night. And the friend, you know, the roommate, not our guy, says, yeah, I mean, it, you know, this scholarship has been a blessing for my family. He's, oh, what kind of scholarship do you have? $8,000. For what? Like, just one time? And what, what did you, you know, is it from your church? No, no, it, it, I got a 29 on the ACT. And so they give me $8,000 a year. So that's $32,000 of merit-based money. Our guy got a 27. He took the ACT once. Nobody told him he could retake it. He should retake it. He might, you know, a 27 to a 29 might just be the difference of a good night's sleep. It might just be knowing what to expect. It might have been a case of jitters. Who knows? Or he may never get more than a 27. But it could have been a $32,000 mistake that he set, stood pat with the 27. So... That's the merit side. The need-based side, and I'll try to make this quick and, and at least pretty easily to, easy to understand. To, first myth, or not the first myth of the night, first myth of the need-based money. I make too much money, we're not wasting time filling out forms. Again, that same sister-in-law, she makes the same money. Matter of fact, I think we make more than she does, and she didn't get any money. That doesn't mean you won't get money. The, the, the FAFSA, F-A-F-S-A, Free Application for Federal Student Aid, and you, know, you were just hearing about the new rules now, it's going to start in October instead of January, and they're going to go with prior, prior year taxes, which I'm happy to answer afterward and explain to you in more detail what that means. But the bottom line is a lot of people don't fill it out because they're not going to get federal grant money. We're not poor. We're not poverty. We're not going to get a grant. We're not wasting our time. And number one, that's just not true in a lot of cases. You, you do make good money, but you don't make enough to pay for school, right? So you have a need. So maybe the school will help you with your need. The second part to that is maybe you want you or, you know, your kids, you want to take the federal loans. Well, the only way you're going to get the loans is you need to do the FAFSA. The FAFSA is the engine in that need-based financial aid process. If you don't fire up the engine, the financial aid train is, we'll switch from a car to a train, is never going to leave the station. So... Filling out the FAFSA is important, and then there's a group of schools that require what's called the CSS profile forms, which is the FAFSA forms on steroids, basically. It's, it's, FAFSA's got 130 plus, plus questions. CSS has more. It's more in-depth. It wants to know, for instance, FAFSA doesn't ask about your home equity on your primary residence. The CSS profile does ask about your home equity. So there are a lot of forms, there's a lot of paperwork, people get intimidated by it, and, and the easiest thing to do sometimes if something seems intimidating or overwhelming is to just not do it and back away from it.
But in many cases, you're costing yourself money when you don't do that. So when you fill out the FAFSA, you're going to get a number back called your EFC, your Expected Family Contribution. And in my estimation, this is the most misleading words you could ever hear. Because what happens is you fill everything out, you're a typical family, let's say your EFC comes back at $11,000. You say, what does that mean? Well, it means you're expected to afford $11,000 a year for college. And maybe this family makes 90 grand a year, they have two kids, you know, a dog, a picket fence, 40 grand in credit card debt, a mortgage. Where are we gonna get 11,000? That's ridiculous. You think we can afford $11,000 a year? And they walk away scratching their head trying to figure out how they're gonna come up with $11,000 a year. Why I think it's misleading is, no offense to any of the college people, but if you have a school that costs 30,000 as a sticker price, right? Tuition, room and board, books, the whole picture. And they think you can afford 11. Your EFC is 11. So you're gonna have 30,000 minus that EFC. That leaves $19,000, okay? $19,000 is your need. That is what that school is saying. Our sticker price minus your EFC leaves your need. So if the need is $19,000, if that school is a school that meets 50% of your need on average, so, so they give you half of that money, they're going to give you $9,500. They're going to give you half of that $19,000. The other half they didn't give you. That's unmet need. Guess who has to come up with the unmet need? You do. So your EFC is really not 11,000. It's 11,000 plus the 9,500 that they didn't help you with. So what you are expected to pay is $20,500. So you were sick when you heard 11,000. <laughs> now it's almost 21,000 or you don't get to go there. Okay, and the second part that is hugely important with that when you get your award letter that explains what the school is gonna do for you Sometimes the schools meet your need, a lot of times they meet your need, by loaning you money. I'm just gonna speak for myself. I don't feel like you gave me a present if I have to pay you back. And so if my need is $19,000 and you're giving me 9,500, but I owe you 8,700 of it at 8%, what did you really do for me? So there's a lot to think about right there. And I'm trying to make sure I get through as quick as possible. Other thing, very important, when you get that award, it's not always accurate. It's not always the best it can be. A lot of times families have special circumstances. There might be situations where there was nowhere on the FAFSA to explain that you were unemployed for six months of the year prior, or that you have some unforeseen medical bills, or that there are situations that impact how much you really can afford that we can't just go by the objective black and white numbers. There are also situations, I'll give you an example that is important to know. Recently, a family I, that I am very well aware of, was their son wanted to go to a very prestigious school, $68,000 a year. The dad said, if you can get in and we can get at least half of that money, I, we can, you can go there. We can probably get $34,000 a year figured out. So they went on the net price calculator on the school's website and they went through the process. Now, there's a lot of reasons people can make mistakes, things go wrong. To make a very long story short, the net price calculator indicated that they wouldn't pay 68,000. They would pay 19,000. So they were celebrating. Now the hard part is the kid still has to get in, right? So he applies, early decision, because one of the school officials told them they would have an increased opportunity, increased odds of getting in. He got in. They got their award letter. They owe $55,000. So literally, I'm just quoting the dad. I don't want to be you know, too graphic. He's like, I threw up in my mouth. I didn't know. I was like, eh. I'm like, thank you for the visual. Here's a breath mint. Okay. So we went on and talked about it a little bit. And, and to be honest with you, he went to his school counselor, a public school, you know, 450 kids to one counselor. So in that situation, they weren't fortunate enough to have the resources that were needed. And she said, there's really nothing you can do about it. He should just go to his second choice. And... We appealed the process, we went through the process. We said the net price calculator said 19,000. 55 and 19 is pretty different. Long story short, it ended up that they're gonna pay $24,000 a year. The kid is going to go to that school. All the holes that were in the award letter and, and the things that went wrong, and, and every situation is different. This doesn't mean, hey everybody, negotiate your award. It's like a used car sale. You'll knock 30 grand off every time. That, that is not the case. But 
had that family sat back and said, oh, I wish we could have sent you to this school, but I'm sorry we can't, the dream would have been dead right there, and that, that wouldn't have been fair because the reality is by working through the process and being able to really make sure of, of what, it, you know, what the end result could be, they got to the achieved res desired result, and they achieved a situation that was very beneficial for them. So also very important to remember, um, it's not always going to be the best. In your packet, you have something else for reading material for later, why I say ignore the sticker price. An example is in there of Washington University and Ohio University. Two very different schools, but especially two extremely different prices. Washington U is almost triple the total sticker price of Ohio U. So naturally, a lot of families would look at Washington U and say, it's almost $300,000 for four years. We're not applying there. You can go to OU. It's a third of the price. But because of what I was explaining before, what's your EFC and what's your need, there are schools, some schools more generous than others. In this case, Wash U has a very nice endowment. They can be very generous. They have given some extremely generous need-based packages, as have the schools that are here tonight, as have all schools. I mean, all schools are capable in a situation of giving a lot of money. These are just two extremes because Washington U is so expensive and Ohio U is thought to be so inexpensive, relatively speaking, although 100000 for four years is still a lot of money. When you look through that and you kind of look through the math and how the process works, Washington University can be just as close to, if not as inexpensive as Ohio University at schools that have endowment money in families that have needs or in, in, in some student situations where they excel and get merit-based money. So when you're making that list initially, where do we want to go to school? When you're thinking about how much you're going to spend, when you're eliminating things, when you're thinking about things, don't let the sticker price be the only driving force because you don't know what's going to happen. You, you don't know how much need you might have. You don't know how much money that school might have. You don't know what might come of the process to wind up netting you something that seemed unachievable. Okay, so that's another hugely important thing. I have three minutes left. Uh, I want to make sure I hit things that are what I consider most important. Another myth that, that is just, you know, very important to remember, four years is the goal, but the national average is ballooned to close to five years for undergrad. I know your kid won't go for five years because he never got less than a C in college. He's getting the scholarship, but kids change their major. Kids go to a school for you know, one of the early on, I saw a family that, you know, the kid was in love with engineering and he actually went to Carnegie Mellon for engineering and he fell in love with marketing when he was there and he didn't like their marketing program and he transferred, which kids can do, but everything he did that freshman year was almost null and void. Things like that happen, talking about passion, finding yourself, 17 years old, you can't necessarily lock in that this is what I want to do for sure, but if I change courses, at least let me be at a school where it'll help me transition or let me take some prep classes for a potential second choice major or minor so that we can get done in four years. Because the easiest way to save money is to go for a year less or borrow for a year less. When you get to that fifth year, it's just extra money you're borrowing, extra money you're spending. Um, if you have questions on any of this, I know we're, we're out of time here. I'll be here for a little bit. My card is on there. You can email me anytime. You could call me. You could text me. Um, I think they're passed out. Yeah. So. This time of year, everybody's kind of getting their awards, making their final decisions. I'm on the phone a lot, but you can always reach me by email, and I will always respond. So if you have any specific questions or things you don't want to talk about tonight, Darren Rose, happy to help you. Good luck with your process. Thanks, Darren. That was some great information. Um, I'm just going to provide a few takeaways that, uh, and Darren touched on this. It's, uh, the first thing is having that conversation with your child about what the family can afford, you know, that's, uh, and do that before you start applying for schools. You know, uh, you don't want to get down the road and, and um, you know, get accepted to somewhere you can't afford. And talk about the debt that you're willing to take on and keep in mind that, you know, a, a lot of debt uh, can, can follow you for a long time. The second thing I would say is, as far as saving, start early. Um, you know, get an idea of what it's going to cost to send the, your kid to, co uh, to school. Uh, figure out what that is on a monthly basis. Figure out how that maybe fits in your budget, and if it's too much, you know, 
start with something. You know, you've got 18 to 22 years to, to work here. You can invest that money, have it grow, and, and working for you. Uh, and the other thing, too, about that is, you know, it's never too late to start. So even if you have somebody in high school, anything that you can save is going to help. Um, the third thing is don't neglect your other, other financial goals. I mean, such as retirement or having an emergency uh, fund set aside. I mean, all that stuff is very important, and uh, you got to find that balance. So I mean, a, lot of, a lot of times you hear folks, um, well, I'm going to focus on this, and then I'll move on to the next. But, you, you know, there's time value of money. So the fourth and, and final thing was, you know, when you, if you have a financial advisor, sit down with them. They, they know your situation. Um, they can talk through it with you. Everybody's situation is different, so they know what, what you're dealing with, and they can uh, talk through and come up so with solutions that will work for you. So those are the things that I would, you know, as far as takeaways for this evening. I hope, you know, you find this whole evening very helpful. I've, I know I've learned a ton of stuff, and, uh, I, you know, I was uh, preparing for this. It was just, uh, yeah, I was thinking, oh, well, I got two two sons, and I'm gonna we we set up their 529s when they were born, and we start funding them with, with as much as we could. But um, you know, after I start researching this, and, and uh, it just it's amazing that there's a, so much more to, to it. So um, you know, thank you for coming out this evening. I, I hopefully hopefully you found this very helpful. So thanks again.